We're glad you're with us and that we're kicking off our new sermon series to the core and talk about our 10 core values. And this week we're talking about community. And community is that connection you have with a group of people. You share something in common with them. And they can be fairly superficial, not a lot of meaning to them. They can be very deep and enduring. Um, I belong to a community. And uh, what bonds us together is a sense of disappointment and heartache over the years. We are Browns fans. Yeah. Although I am hoping that... I hope that this afternoon you Bengals fans are heartbroken at 4.30. Just, <laughs> just saying. But I don't think it's going to happen. All right. However, OH. Yeah, a bunch of Buckeye fans. So I have a special uh, Buckeye treat, not the candy, uh, for the 10 biggest Buckeye fans in the room that get down here first. 10 of you. If you want it. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, I think we got a little too many. So I'll let you guys figure it out. I actually have one more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, we got, we're good. You don't have to fight over it. So my wife and I are watching Wiggles, which is our, our son and daughter-in-law's dog this past week. So we took Wiggles and Lulu on several walks through the Englewood Reserve, and lo and behold, I'm watching where I'm going, and I'm seeing Buckeyes. So you get your own CLC souvenir Buckeye, all right? That was worth the run down here. Help you with your health. All right, there you go. There you go. If you are wondering, if you want to find your own, it's on the green trail uh, at the Englewood Reserve. And I happen just to think, you know, our mascot is a nut. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. So anyways, there you go. Um, that's about as light hard as we're going to get. We're going to take a deep dive now uh, talking about community. Because we share or should share, share something in common that we are a community. And so when we look at our core values, we spent a lot of time in the early 90s as a leadership team, the board and our staff and then lay leaders, really deciding, okay, what's at the core of who we are that's going to guide us and, and keep us? And we really, we spent hours praying and deliberating on these. And um, my, my office, we use the sticky note marker pads, you know, so I had those all over my walls. I looked like I was living a beautiful mind, if you've seen that movie. Uh, and we, we wordsmith them. And here is what we came up with for community. Very intentional. If you would read out loud with me, and we're saying what we believe, so read it with some, some passion, okay? We believe God designed us to serve, to value others above ourselves, and to be served to allow others to fulfill the needs in our lives. As we are obedient to this calling, God brings together our talents and abilities to form a powerful Christian community. Now, if that's curious to you, the reason why we talked about designed us to serve and to be served, we said it's superficial until you get to a point, people have to know you well enough to know what your needs are. And you have to be willing to be vulnerable because if you let those needs be known, you can be disappointed or not. And so it takes a level of vulnerability in the community to serve other people, but also to allow them to serve you. But when you do, uh, the synergy that it, that has with our talents and abilities is just pretty incredible. And I believe that the community in this place is needed now more than ever. I read a report from uh, the Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy, that came out in March. And the headline says that he raises an alarm about the devastating impact of the epidemic of loneliness and isolation in the United States. Let me read some of that report. The Surgeon General released uh, an advisory calling attention to the public health crisis of loneliness, isolation, and lack of connection in our country. Public health crisis. Even before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, approximately half of U.S. adults reported experiencing measurable levels of loneliness. Disconnection fundamentally affects our mental, physical, and societal health. 
In fact, loneliness and isolation increase the risk for individuals to develop mental health challenges in their lives and lacking connection can increase the risk of premature death, get this, to levels comparable to smoking daily. Lack of connection, isolation. Across all age, as he said, it warns that the physical consequences of poor connection can be devastating, including a 29% increased risk of heart disease. If you're alone, no connection, your chance of heart disease is almost 30% higher. A 32% increased risk of stroke and a 50% increased risk of developing dementia for older adults. That is staggering. He said across all age groups, people are spending less time with each other in person than two decades ago. Coincidentally, that's about the time these things were born. Uh, the advisory reported that this was most pronounced in young people aged 15 to 24 who had 70% less social interaction with their friends. He said, we also know that for some kids, being online has been a way to find community at a time when many of them have not been able to. What we need to protect against, though, are the elements of technology and social media in particular that seek to maximize the amount of time that our children are spending online at the expense of their in-person interactions. And my first thought to that was, that ship has sailed, friend. When you look at social media, we've talked about it before, the people who design social media are brilliant individuals and they have designed it to be addicting. And they understand physiology. We talked about the mental health series we did earlier in the year. Body, soul, and spirit were created. And there are, there are physiological things that happen. The dopamine hits alone that happen when you get one of these on social media or a comment. It is made to be addicting, and it is. And when he talked about how they're spending more time online at the expense of their personal interactions, all you have to do is go to a social place go out to eat, look around the restaurant, go to a sporting event, go wherever, okay? And what you will find, and it's not just young people, okay? But you'll see an entire family going out to eat together and they're all sitting at the table doing this. And my, my favorite, photo, favorite sad photograph uh, I shared a few years ago was Joyce and I went to, to Disneyland for a few hours when we were out there. And we were in one of those big Ferris wheels with Mickey Mouse on it. And it was big enough that they, they combined you with other people uh, because there's only two of us. And so the two of us sat on one side and there was a, a dad slash husband and his wife and his teenage daughter across from us. And I, I did one of these things and took this picture. I could find it, it's in here. I, just, I, I took their picture without him seeing me because he's sitting in the Ferris wheel at Disneyland together, family time. So his arm around his wife, he's looking over his daughter and she's on her phone and the wife is on his phone. He's just kind of caught in the middle. And that's connection. That's family time. And no wonder isolation and loneliness is epidemic. Our Surgeon General had six recommendations, including pro-connection public policies. Not a big fan of that. Not, not, not optimism. Um, mobilize the health sector, more robust research. And I want to say that that's not a correct prescription for our problem. I believe if you have the app, you can follow along, uh, properly understood and lived out. Church is the antidote to our societal epidemic of loneliness. And when I say church, I don't mean hurrying up in the parking lot and getting in here and finding a seat and spending 75 minutes with us and then getting up and leaving and hi, how are you? And that's it. That's, this is the tip of an iceberg. It's meant to be the tip of an iceberg. And the tip of the iceberg is the tip of a, of, of, there's a much larger relational spiritual uh, life together dimension of what church is. Unfortunately for many of you, this is church to you. And so the good news is you have a load of benefit coming to you if you allow yourself. But I believe that, that we as the church are really the, the antidote to our society. And when I say church, I go back to the original word in the, in the original language, ecclesia. And it means a called out gathering together body of believers with Christ as our head, united and empowered by the Holy Spirit. That 
his church. It's a body of believers called out from our culture. We're united by the Holy Spirit and we are empowered together by the Holy Spirit. You read the, you read the, the Acts 1-8 verse. And that's who we are to be. And when we is in us, we can change the world. When we is an us, with Christ as the head, empowered by the Holy Spirit, united together. When we is an us, I'm going to kind of unpack. We can be the antidote to the health crisis of our nation. That's a pretty tall order. But let me read for you uh, Ephesians chapter 3. I've quoted it hundreds of times in my time as lead pastor. And as I was going to use it this weekend. I thought, okay, is that a proper application? And as, as I backed up to the verses before it, I thought this is probably the, the most accurate application in context. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly, say far more, beyond all we could ask or think, man, can God possibly use us to be the antidote for our society? According to the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him be glory in the called out gathering together body of believers with Christ as our head, united in power by the Holy Spirit. That is what Christ can do. That is who he can use us to be in our culture. And as I, I backed up to the verses before, read 15 to 19 on your own. It talks about being strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person we are that Christ were rooted and grounded in love. We're, we comprehend with all the saints the love of God and the love we have for each other. And he can do far more abundantly in us and through us. Now more than ever, our culture needs us to be us. That's a good amen point to say. Uh, when we did God Size Vision 3.0 back in the spring, you talked about Jerusalem, where you live, where you worship. One statement that I made was, is that our prayer is that for everyone coming to CLC from now on, this would be true for them to say. Would you repeat it with me? Someone invited me. It was easy to get connected and involved and people care that I do. That last part is huge. If we get that last part right and people care that I do, it would be revolutionary for us. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask yourself the question, I wonder how they're doing. I wonder if they are connected. I wonder if they are involved. I wonder if they feel like they are part of us. Okay, got those questions? Now, it's rude when you just stare at people, but I'm asking you to. So I want you to just look at people, look to your left, look to your right, look behind you, and just look at, smile, because it's always nicer to smile, okay? Look at them and wonder that. I wonder if they're connected. Just think about it. I wonder if they're involved. What if they feel like us? And uh, as you have that question, that, let me please encourage you, make that your preoccupation, one of them when you come in here. I wonder who God puts around me today. I wonder who I'm sitting with. A young man, last service came up to me and uh, he grew up here and he shared how far he is from God and how he's trying to come back. And wow, today is exactly what I needed. And, and basically he said, I need us. You have no idea what the person's going through in life around you and they need an us. And I'm, I'm not naive. I, when I talk about the, the epidemic of isolation in our culture, well, guess where you came from when, when you got out of your car? You came from our culture. And I'm not naive enough to think, but everybody in here is not isolated and nobody's lonely in here. No, I know you can sit in church and feel very lonely. And some of you are feeling very alone. And so I pray that, that today is, is a day that you say, okay, I'm going to take some steps to do something about it. Because one of, the, one of the things about loneliness and feeling all alone and isolated is, well, if somebody, you know, if they do what he said, then I wouldn't feel isolated. Well, you know, it's the old, you want a friend, be a friend. Take the first step and I... And I I'm pretty confident God will honor that and people will take that step towards you. And so uh, let's go to the, the first or the next point. And it says that CLC with your yes will be a church that loves. Now, I've got three points to start that way. CLC with your yes. So you have a response. When I say CLC with your yes, you're going to say, yes. okay, I caught you off guard. I want you to 
Do it again, okay? So I'm going to say it, and when I say with your yes, and you're going to give me an enthusiastic. <clears throat> CLC with your yes. Yes! Oh, that was good. We'll be a church that loves. But that's, that's good. I'll take it twice. That's good. I was, I was just shooting for once. We'll raise the bar. Um, when Jesus said, Here's the, here is the test people will use. This is how they'll know if you're my disciples. It really isn't, although I'm thrilled that we can give away two and a half million dollars a year to other ministries in need, like we just did 100,000 to Ukraine. It's not that. It's not if you're real religious, if you come to church all the time. If you go, no, here's how they're going to know. John 13, 34, a new commandment. Say commandment. That's the law. It's not an idea. It's not a suggestion. It's not something you might want to do. It is a commandment. You want to follow me. Here's a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Wow, he raises the bar there, because Jesus loved pretty, really well. That you also love one another. By this, all men will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The most God-hating, could care less about the Bible, the church, or Christianity person who walks into this place should say there's something about these people that reminds me of what I think Jesus would be like. It's the way they treat each other. And, and they would make that observation if we don't just all in unison hurry in and hurry out in 75 minutes and we just punch our card. And we, no, no, there's an us here. And the us itself should be contagious and inviting to them. And so when we talk about love, a uh, definition of that that I really like is active self-giving concern for the well-being of others. It's a nice definition. Active, self-giving concern for the well-being of others. I don't just say I love you. I'm willing to be active. I'm willing to put that into, into action. And, and it, it gives of me. I'm willing to sacrifice or, or whatever I need to do for your well-being. So first of all, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Who is somebody in your life and let's go non-family, all right? So not related or, or married to. But who is somebody who has shown active, self-giving concern for your well-being sometime in your past? Just think about it. Maybe think of a few. All right? You might go ahead and just say a prayer of thanks. Thank you, God, for whoever that is. So let's ask another question. Who is somebody at... CLC that you have, that you love or have shown love to here at our church. So who do you love or have shown love to at CLC that's not a relative where you have shown active self-giving concern for their well-being? Who would that be and how did you do it recently? Hopefully, things are popping in your mind. And it doesn't have to be huge things. There's about 18 people, two dozen people that are willing to express their love for you in an active, self-giving concern for your well-being. And when you were just thinking about getting up, they were already here at 7.15 this morning getting cones out of the garage and placing them all over the parking lot that you are lovingly and appreciatively going to drive around when you leave. <laughs> all right? They're our parking team. They are here rain or shine. If that's not an expression of love every Sunday morning, I don't know what is. There are people who are showing an active, self-giving concern for the well-being of you and your baby or your preschooler or your child or your teenager by serving in that part of the building in our next-gen ministries. And they, and they do it regularly. There are people who are active in their self-giving concern and well-being for you in making sure you had coffee when you came in. And it's amazing. Coffee drinkers, we love them, right? So it doesn't have to be huge stuff. But in what way do you actively show your concern and for the well-being of others? And it's not just doing it here. If we just do it here, we're, we're, we're a click. We don't want to be nice to each other here and then we treat everybody else like garbage out there. No, it should be all that out there. And, we, and in here, it just goes on steroids. So I want us to do a, a loving exercise where we are active in our self-giving concern for the well-being of others. Uh, and so this is one of the few times I'll ask you to get your cell phone out. Okay, come on. If you got one, get it out. And don't tell me you don't have one. Last night I called a guy out right on the front row. And he goes, it's in the car. 
he was brand new. I don't think he'll be back. But <laughs> Okay, if you got a cell phone, get it out. Come on. You guys don't have cell phones. Come on. Left it at home. Okay, you get a pat. When you get home, you do this. All right? Okay. All right. Um, this is one of the funnest, doesn't cost you a thing, things to do, that actually appeals to us when we were this big. Because when you were around this big, you wanted to help and do stuff. And, and it was amazing when somebody in your life, whether it was a parent, a teacher, or a loved one, gave you an attagirl, attaboy. Good job. Daddy, mommy's so proud. Daddy, yeah. And, and we never get to where we don't like a girl or a boy for us. We might be, oh, it's, there's something about it that likes to be affirmed in what I did. And I brought value. I'm reminded of that all the time. I love doing it. Yesterday was Joyce's birthday. And so we, we went to George's for breakfast, one of our favorite places. I dropped her off and I pulled her on the back and I parked my truck. And there was a guy out having a smoke break. And so as I was going, I said, why are you smoking? That's bad for your health. No, I didn't, I didn't say that. <laughs> no, I said, are you, the, are you one of the cooks? No, I'm a dishwasher. I, uh, no, I said, you know what? Every time we come to this place, it just flows. It is a great experience. I know you're hustling your tail off to make that happen. Thanks, I appreciate that. You just thought I gave him a hundred bucks. Man, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Man, have a good day. Appreciate it. <laughs> I said, I appreciate you. Thanks for what you do. On my way out, Another guy was taking a smoke break and I did the same thing. There's just something, you can give away to somebody. Hey, you matter. What you do counts. And so we're going to do that today. All right. We're going to go ahead and put in action active self-giving concern for the well-being of somebody else. I want you to text somebody now. All right. So go to your text messages and you can go ahead and you can blame me. Pastor Stan said to text somebody, you know, but... Um, Hey, sitting in church, challenged me about people I appreciate. I want you to know I appreciate you. You can be specific. I'm glad you're my friend. Appreciate all you've done, whatever. Just to send a text of appreciation to somebody that you're not related to now. Go. Let's do it. Makes me smile just thinking about this friend. Been friends for over 30 years. And I don't know if you have the, uh, I'll wait, some of you are still texting. If you want the chapter and verse, it was John 13, 34, 35. To, <laughs> no. Okay, if your thumbs can go a little faster, I do have a couple more points here. <laughs> Here's what just happened. We, you just made the day for hundreds of people. And I don't know if you're like me, like my, my text messages, I get enough of them that they're not all ones I go, oh, that was good. So I'm always a little apprehensive, what's this one gonna say? So it's like, ah, oh, you, just, you just made somebody smile. Oh, you know what? You gave them that attaboy, girl. You gave them that I matter, I value, I made a difference feeling. It's an easy thing to do. And so it's not just all huge things. All right, next point. Are you ready? You got your line coming up. CLC with your yes. 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 Good. We'll be a place that shares life together. Man, this is a, this is a big one. And it's all over the map because life's all over the map. Yes, it's, it's up, it's down, it's good, it's bad. 
couple of verses for that. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Paul says, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Remember law, commandment, a new commandment I give to you? What's the commandment? You love each other as I love you. If you want to fulfill that, you bear each other's burdens. You help each other with their stuff. How many of you got stuff besides me? Now, if you're going to help me with my stuff, I got to trust you enough to share my stuff, my struggles, my issues, my concerns. And, and vice versa. And then in Romans, Paul kind of goes the gamut in chapter 12, verse 10. Chapter 12 is a great chapter just to read in general. But he said, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So all across the spectrum of life, be there. Do life together. Don't be isolated and alone. It's bad for your health in every way and it doesn't bring the connection God intends for us to have here. And so at CLC, there are lots of opportunities for you to do life together, lots of opportunities to connect. Again, they're not all huge. I'll share some real easy ones uh, and some that just happened before the service. Uh, but one example of what we do in groups that's really helpful is when you go through the loss of a loved one, it can be devastating. Grief takes a long time. It, it's different phases you go through. It's three steps forward, a step or two back. And, and some of you that are struggling with the loss of a loved one, and I don't care if it's been a year ago or two years ago, people say you should be over it by now. Well, wherever you're at is where you're at. We have a ministry called Grief Share, and it's a really powerful us that might be for you. Watch this. Um, hi, I'm Deb Graham. I co-facilitate Grief Share Ministries at CLC. Um, Grief Share is just really an opportunity for people who are going through the loss of a loved one to be able to come and begin and continue their healing process. Because you're, you're learning a bit because there are things that you don't know about you know, going through the grief uh, journey. But more importantly, you have people who go alongside with you um, because it's a, it's a lonely journey and without others to be there, um, it's, just, it's just overwhelming. So Grief Share really relies on community uh, with others to help through that process. Yeah, so I think about um, last group. Uh, they came in, many of them scared, um, overwhelmed, sad, and very much alone. And by the end, I saw groups of people who had built relationships that will endure through the rest of their life, that pray for each other, that occasionally get together, that just continue to build and to care about each other in ways that you really can't explain and certainly um, would never have just happened in the, in the casual interactions that you have at church. I really just can't say enough about grief share and, the, and how community makes a huge difference in our ability to um, to be able to interact with others and to feel that someone cares about you at the same time that you care about them. You know, being part of a group um, at CLC, it's a, it's a large church. It gives you so many opportunities to be involved in things. But when you come, you can feel really lonely because you're the, if you're the only one, if you haven't been part of a group, you see people, but it's so superficial. And then when you become part of a group, you meet people and you begin to know a little bit about them and they get to know a little bit about you and you build relationships that make it so much more not only enjoyable but providing a support system for you both through the good things and the bad things in your life. Community can be experienced in every season of your life. There are times in your life where you are going through a lot of pain and difficulties um, and there are groups for that. There are other times in your life where you just want to have fun and you want to have fellowship. And then much of your life you want to experience um, through learning and developing and, and growing and becoming closer to God. So all of those are opportunities that we offer here at CLC. If you haven't gotten involved in a, in a community, in a group yet, I strongly encourage you to give it a try. And if the first one doesn't work, go try another one because there are so many different options here. You're sure to find something that's going to work great for you. If you're going through that, it's a great place to be. It starts this Wednesday. Come in door two or three and go to the 600 hallway, and it's down that hallway. Uh, I remember Deb asked me to speak there sometime this past year, and, and people sat there largely with tears streaming on their face. I thought, man, I'm not helping people at all. I said, was that okay? She goes, no, it was good, because we're honest there, and we're, we're 
free with our feelings and so on that we need to be able to share and to grieve together and to, and to go through that. So if you're going through that, boy, it's a great place. Another place that is excellent in uh, just sharing what you're going, if you have any hurts in your life or if you've got habits you can't break or just hangups that just keep getting in your way, uh, another great place uh, is tomorrow night, Celebrate Recovery. Uh, come in door two at six o'clock. There's dinner there in the cafe. About 100 people will gather together and then there's a kind of a, a larger group experience and you can break off into smaller groups and get to know other people. And you'll find men and women there that are going through similar challenges and the struggle often feels a lot the same. But going through it together, there's an encouragement and a strength uh, that will really help you overcome that and learn to go beyond it. And so I'm thankful we have Celebrate Recovery and many of you just keep saying, man, it's, it's great, it's awesome, which I know. So join us for that if that's what you're going through. But not all that we have is, is dealing with struggles and issues in life. That's part of life. Uh, a lot of our group life and activity and engagement is really fun. And so Wednesday night, we had our first Wednesday prayer service and a bunch of our young, young adults, our young people, kids, teens, and, and youth were here. And so we said, hey, tell us just real briefly what you experience in community and small group in our next gen ministries. And so this is what they told us. I love the community and the small groups in student life because I'm able to make close relationships with people like this guy. And I love the community at student life because I get to make long-lasting friendships with people like this guy. I love the community at student life because people are always willing to talk and listen. I love the community in my student life small group because everyone is vulnerable, so I feel more willing to open up to my friends and my small group leader. I love the community at Student Life because it has given me a second family, and all of them help me grow closer to Jesus each and every day. And uh, yeah, if you're in middle school, they meet... They meet right now in the Student Life Center uh, during this service. We'd love to have you. And if you're in high school uh, tonight at uh, 6.30, let's give a shout out, right? Woo! So join us in the Student Life Center. Uh, beyond that, uh, Saturday night has their own monthly social. I talked about that last night for Saturday, folks. Uh, and then in between, sir, again, it's not huge. It can start small. In between services, while the weather's nice, we launched coffee in the courtyard a couple weeks ago. And I was just in the courtyard before service having coffee with folks and got to meet some new people. Uh, come a little early. Go through the courtyard. Grab a cup of coffee or whatever you're drinking, and just, uh, just enjoy connecting with people, making that first step. Uh, likewise, say next Sunday. Next Sunday, maybe go to church first service, change it up a little bit, and then join us for uh, Cafe Life Groups. Uh, at 10.30 in the cafe, show up there, sit at a table, meet some new people. And uh, Terry Marluta Carell are going to be leading a deeper dive on the things we talked about during the weekend there. It's a great way just to get to know people, get to build some friendships. Uh, and also on Wednesday nights, we have deeper dive. Uh, and uh, this summer, I did deeper dives all, all summer on Wednesday nights on end times. And we sat at round tables. And by the time the summer was halfway through, people sat at the same table. By the time summer was over, they became friends. And they hang out afterwards and meet beforehand. So uh, join us Wednesday night. We do a deeper dive uh, in the West Auditorium at 7 o'clock. Just show up and you'll get to know some people. And if you went to the Global Leadership Summit, it's two days of inspiration about how to lead and maximize what God's given you. It's in August. Uh, we, we do that the last several years. And uh, I do kind of a follow-up GLS leaders meeting and our leaders gathering is this Tuesday if you want to join us. If you're in the marketplace, how do, you, how do you maximize your impact, whether it's the business world, education, healthcare, whatever it might be. Uh, it's at 7 a.m. We have a continental breakfast. We're done by 8. And uh, for starters, we're going to jump into a book a friend recommended to me, Leadership Not by the Book, by David Green, who founded Hobby Lobby. Some really fascinating principles there for your life and what God's called you to. And finally, if you're new to CLC, how do I make this place my church home? We have something called Growth Track, the second and third Wednesday of the month. So this Wednesday, join us in the, the, the uh, Welcome Center there. And uh, it'll be a chance for you to get to know us, how to get involved. I'll be there members of our leadership team will be there uh, 7 o'clock this Wednesday. 
And I can't emphasize enough, if you can take the leap into a group, you can stop by the Welcome Center for information how to do that. Go to our website, go to our, our, our app. Uh, I was talking to a young mom uh, last week. I wish I had videoed her conversation with me. And she says, yeah, you know, so I asked, you know, what part of town you live in? How'd you start coming, yada, yada. Well, we drive by, it's kind of hard to miss, you know. And she said, we moved up to this part of town. We used to be in a real big church and I really didn't want to go to another big church because I just felt never, I connected or I felt it was impersonal. And she said, and then I met, she listed a couple of names, a couple of gals in the church, young moms. I met them, they invited me to our, their small group and I just love it now. And it was fun because I told that story and she was sitting on the second row last service and her friends were all down there. And so after service, I go, she was my sermon illustration and you guys are the ones that did it. So, yay. so uh, it really does make a difference. And, and again, when you go back to someone invited me, it was easy to get connected and involved and people care that I do. When we care about the other people around us, are they connected? Do they feel part of us? That's huge. And then finally, CLC with your yes, yes will be a place where everyone is valued as a gifted contributing member of us. And boy, that's essential. And I don't just say it as words. Every person here, every part of the body of Christ matters. And there's, I remember Frida Putoff, I've, I think I've quoted her before. She's since gone to heaven Years ago, uh, when we had a printed bulletin, uh, back in the 90s, early 90s, my, my day off was Thursday, not Friday. And so I, I would work Fridays and I'd come in. And uh, every Friday, you could set your calendar by it. Frida would be there and she was stuffing bulletins. So I'd go grab a cup of coffee around two o'clock in the kitchen and she was in there at the table stuffing bulletins. I'd sit down and chat a little bit. And, and Frida sent me a note that was very humbling uh, she said, Pastor Stan, I just want to tell you, first of all, thanks for knowing my name and just taking the time to get acquainted. And that was like, wow, we all need to be connected. And the second thing she said, thanks for letting me stuff bulletins. I feel like I belong. And she was really emphasizing to me a spiritual truth. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, it says, to each one, say that means me, if you're a Christian, it does. To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Every believer has a spiritual gift or two, maybe a few, but not all of them, for everybody else's good. And if I had all the spiritual gifts, I'd be self-sufficient. I wouldn't need you. You wouldn't need me if you had them all. But I have a couple, you have a couple, and together we, we make up a whole. And the most common spiritual gift, and if you don't know what your spirit, you should be able to answer these two questions. What are your spiritual gifts? And how are you using them in the body of Christ for us? If you don't know, come to Growth Track because week two, we, we help you figure that out. And there's a couple dozen of them. They go from real practical like the gift of helps, uh, administration, leadership, teaching. There's supernatural gifts and miracles, healing, whatnot. Uh, but God's given all of us a couple, few of them to use for each other. And Frida was simply saying, when I get to use my spiritual gift, it's the most common one, the gift of helps, because it's the most needed. When I get to use my spiritual gift, I feel good inside. I never feel bad how, asking people how they're gifted, what their interests are, and helping them find a way to serve. I never feel bad asking you to serve in the church because I know that when your spiritual gift lines up with how you're spending your time and your energy, when you are actively self-giving concern for the well-being of others and using your spiritual gift, it is a <sighs> like nothing else. Frida was making that clear. And all of us matter in the body of Christ. And Satan's really good at telling us, not only are you lonely and disconnected, you don't even matter. But <laughs> nothing's further from the truth. And when it comes to people who matter, uh, those of us in church leadership are struggling with one area of how people matter and how do we connect that. Uh, in addition to the people that are here, every weekend, there are 800 to 1,000 of you who are watching online. Some of you have other churches you just like to watch CLC as well, that's fine. But some of you work kind of your connection. And so um, I like to ask you online two questions and you who are in the room can just relax right now. Um, but there's a number across your screen as the lower third. And we'd like you to text the answer to two questions. The first question 
is watching this device, whether it's a phone or a tablet or a TV or a laptop, how many people normally watch this device? Is, is it one, you yourself, or you watching with someone else or a group or a family? Uh, and we've gotten lots of answers over the weekend. So how many are watching the device? Just, just text that in. And then the second question to answer is, what's your darkest secret? No. Um, <laughs> let's connect. No. Uh, <laughs> the second question is what, where are you? What city or town are you in? We're finding most are in Ohio, but we've had people across the country, even Alaska, some people around the world. So how many are watching and where are you watching from? And I know some of you are family and friends of mine from way back. So I got cousins in California and, and friends in the Midwest and Far West and Seal Sears and Phoenix that watch every week that left here and whatever. But some of you, you know, where are you at? We'd love to know that. And thank you. And you matter to us. We're trying to figure out how we can connect better. And I know being online, people also like to be anonymous. Uh, so we're not going to bug you and, and chase you down, but let us know. And for those of us that are here, Paul goes deeper in 1 Corinthians and he says, for the body is not one member, but many. And then he goes into this analogy, some are the hand, some are the foot, because you're an eye, you're not an ear, doesn't mean you're not needed because you're a foot, you know, you're not a hand, doesn't mean you're not needed. Whatever your gift is, whatever your place is in the body, I don't care if you're the spleen of the body of Christ. I love my, I don't even know where my spleen is in here, but I'm glad he's there, I hope he's fine, all right? All of us matter, just say, I matter. Turn to somebody, tell them, you do too. We all matter. And then he goes on and says, so there may be no division in the body. You've heard me say countless times, Satan does not fear a big church. He fears a united church. But that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And so we thought it'd be appropriate to, to end with communion as we celebrate the body of Christ. If you didn't receive the elements when you came in, if you raise your hand, you have a section leader who is willing to show their act of self-giving concern for you and they'll bring you the elements. Just raise your hand, they'll, they'll get it to you. And as that's happening, if you're a Christian, you're welcome to celebrate communion with us. As we're doing that, the team is gonna sh share a song that's called Togetherness. In the song, it says that God, to God, you bless our togetherness. God is all about our us. That's what he wants. He wants you to take the steps, to put the effort out, to, to be part of us. He wants us likewise to reciprocate and care that you do. And so as you hear the song, first of all, let yourself take a trip down memory lane to the people in your life that have blessed you that have shown their love for you in practical ways for your well-being, especially those who are of the family of faith. And then also allow the Holy Spirit to examine you, as the Bible says at communion, am I contributing to and doing my part to be part of us that I can make a difference in the lives of others as we celebrate togetherness? Such a big divide. Why, oh, why? All accusations, but no conversations. Oh, way too busy. Different in more than a million ways 
beautiful colors that plead the same. A long way to go, but we're on our way. We're on our way. Brothers and sisters in need of forgiveness, oh, lead us back to. perfect song for this message and as we share communion I'll confess to you that when I typically read from Paul's instruction about it 1 Corinthians 11 I go right to the verse where he instructs it and I, I don't read its larger context what I do read is for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed he took bread when he given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He tells us then to examine ourselves or lest we drink judgment to ourselves. And he said, he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment if he does not judge the body rightly, discern the body rightly. In fact, many of them were experiencing judgment, sickness and even death because of that. And the context is that Paul is confronting the Corinthian church that was a church full of issues, known for their division, known for their hostility toward each other as believers. 
He says in verse 17, in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be divisions among you in order that those who are approved may have become evident among you. So it's competing people within the church. Therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. It talks about how they had the haves and the have-nots and some ate a bunch and some ate hardly any and they came hungry. And he says, don't you have houses for that? And he says, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I will not praise you in this. We're to be united. We are, we are to be a called out gathering together body of believers with Christ as our head, united and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we are the antidote to the isolation that's killing our culture, you and me. And the biggest enemy of that, I know it is for me, is I'm just a doggone busy. We're in a hurry. We got so much to do, so much to get done, so much on our plate, so much on our calendar. And so we, we hurry here and we hurry there and we just, we just check in and check out. And so would you bow with me in prayer? We're to examine ourselves. First of all, examine your life and just say a prayer of thanks for those Christians in your life who have expressed their self-giving concern for your well-being through the years. Just thank God for who they are. Because the Lord's Supper is a time of gratitude. Thank you. We're so grateful, Lord, for those you're bringing to our thoughts, family members and friends, brothers and sisters in the body of Christ now and through the years. Thank you for them. If they're still on the planet, we pray your blessing in their life. And now allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart and ask the question, Lord, am I, am I contributing to us? Am I willing to show active self-giving concern for the well-being of the person next to me, behind me, the person that I know that I come in contact with that's part of my, our church family? Am I loving and caring like you want me to? If you feel convicted, repent of it. And if you struggle, as most of us do, ask him, Lord, increase my time and my availability, even in little ways, to make our church a more connecting, loving, relational place that others can be blessed, but that you also use that to bless me. So Lord, we we look forward to the days ahead that that you will chase away the loneliness and isolation in our own life. And that as we bless others, you'll likewise use them to be a blessing to us. And Lord, we pray that CLC is a loving, caring, compassionate, valuing place. And that all who come here sense that and they know we are your followers because of the way we love each other. Let that be true in our life, in my life, we pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody who agreed said, amen. Let's take the bread and the cup together. So I pray a blessing of God's love in your life that so fills you that you can't help but want to share that with others. I pray that God blesses you with people who will reach out and connect with you as you reach out and connect with them and he will bless you with a sense of purpose when you come here, not just to receive, but to love and to care in big ways and small. God bless you. Have an amazing week. We'll see you Wednesday night. Thanks for being here.